In this presentation, we will talk about Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2. As always, I would read the chapters before watching this or listening, if you're listening in an audio format on podcast form, and know the basic storyline and some of the details, and I think you'll get more out of it. Those who are listening to this on a podcast form know that I record this as a YouTube channel, and so there are slides that go along with this. And if you ever want to see them, then you can go to the YouTube format and Coming Unto Christ, Michael S. Clough. So let's consider first Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 2 verses 1 through 2 talks about the star and wise men. Notice we're going to see that it says that there was a new star, not necessarily that it was a bright star that no one could miss. Have you ever noticed on any Christmas card or anything we do with the star, it's always this bright shining star that nobody could miss with a tail pointing down towards Bethlehem. Uh, even apostates would have caught that. But this isn't what the scriptures say. It just says it's a new star. And where we have that from is Helaman 14.5 says, And behold, there shall a new star arise, such an one as ye never have beheld. And this also shall be a sign unto you. And then in 3 Nephi 1.20-21 it says, And it shall come to pass, yea, all things, every whit, according to the words of the prophets. And it came to pass also that a new star did appear according to the word. So it wasn't didn't necessarily have to be this bright star that stood out and just beaming that everybody saw. We know that hardly anybody recognized this new star. Even the shepherds did not see when it was the angel or the yeah, the angel that had to tell them to go into Bethlehem and to find the child wrapped in swaddling clothes. And so could you imagine the amount of time and consecration effort, concentration and effort that have taken to every night study the heavens and study them and to be familiar with all those stars and then to notice that a new star appeared that was not there the night before. That is paying attention to detail. That is atten paying attention to signs. Do we put that much commitment into the signs of the second coming? It's a good thing to think about. Again, a new star, not a bright star. Why do they go to Jerusalem? The Bible in the Book of Mormon prophesies the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Notice the wise men go to Jerusalem. The Book of Mormon clearly prophesies that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. However, in Book of Mormon scripture, notice this prophecy in the book of Alma. But behold, the Spirit saith unto thee, saith this much unto me, saying, Cry unto this people, saying, Repent ye, and prepare the way of the Lord, and walk in his paths which are straight. For behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the kingdom of God cometh upon the face of the earth. And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, and bring forth the Son, yea, even the Son of God. Alma 7, 9 through 10. Notice in the Book of Mormon prophecies that it is prophesied that Christ would be born at Jerusalem, meaning at, meaning in the area of, not in Jerusalem, at Jerusalem, which Bethlehem is. Bethlehem's just five minutes away. It's, it's in the area of Jerusalem. This tells me that those wise men are then men who were familiar with the prophecies of the Book of Mormon, not of the Old Testament. See, the brass plates would not have had the Book of Micah on them. That's why the Book of Mormon prophets would not have had that prophecy. They had this one. And so I'm contending that the wise men come from America. That's why it takes one to two years before they even get there. 
It says in Helaman 16, verses 13 through 14, notice the wording, but it came to pass in the 90th year of the reign of the judges, there were great signs given unto the people and wonders, and the words of the prophets began to be fulfilled. And angels did appear unto men, wise men, and did declare unto them glad tidings of great joy. Thus in this year, the scriptures began to be fulfilled. That wording, glad tidings of great joy, is very Matthew 2 vernacular, isn't it? And that there were wise men in the Americas. This is from Helaman 16, 13 through 14. And so I maintain that the wise men come from America because they go to Jerusalem and they say, where is he? Where's the king of the Jews? We were told he would be born at Jerusalem. And it's not until Herod consults the scholars, the scribes, and the Pharisees of the scriptures, and they say, oh, it's specifically in Bethlehem. Then the wise men go to Bethlehem. As I said here, Matthew 2, 4 through 9, not until the wise men heard the chief priests and scribes tell them that the Messiah was born in Bethlehem after searching the scriptures, the Bible, did they know where to go? So this is strong evidence that they came from America because they had the prophecies of the Book of Mormon. Matthew 2-3, through three, Herod is troubled in all Jerusalem. We read in Matthew 2-3, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Okay, let me point out to you, Jerusalem is not troubled because the Messiah is born. They're troubled because Herod's troubled. And let, let me show you, let me tell you a little bit about this King Herod and how corrupt and, and wicked he really was. Concerning Herod, the great scholar Frederick Farrar writes the following. His whole career was bled, was red with blood of murder. He had massacred priests and nobles. He had decimated the Sanhedrin. He had caused the high priest, his brother-in-law, the young and noble Aristobulus, to be drowned in pretended sport before his eyes. He had ordered the strangulation of his favorite wife, the beautiful Asmonean princess Mariamne, though she seems to have been the only human being who passionately, him, whom he passionately loved. His son Alexander, Aristobulus, and Antipater, his uncle Joseph, Antagonus, and Alexander, the uncle of the father of his wife, his mother-in-law, Alexandra, his kingman, Cortabanus, his friends, Dithosinus and Gladys, were but a few of the multitude who fell victim to his sanguinary, suspicious, and guilty terrors. His brother, Pheroras, and his son, Archelaus, barely and narrowly escaped execution by his orders. Neither the blooming youth of the prince, Aristobulus, nor the white hairs of the king, Herancus, had protected them from his fawning and treacherous fury. Death by strangulation, death by burning, death by being cleft asunder, death by secret assassination, confessions forced by unutterable unutterable torture, acts of insolence and humane lust marks the annals of his reign, which were so cruel that in the energetic language of Jewish ambassador to the Emperor Augustus, the survivors during his lifetime were even more miserable than the sufferers. Every dark and brutal instinct of his character seemed to be acquired fresh intensity as his life drew to its close. Haunted by the scepters of his murdered wife and murdered sons, agitated by the conflicting furies of remorse and blood, the pitiless monster, as Josephus calls him, was seized in his last days by a black and bitter ferocity which broke out against all with whom he came in contact. Herod murdered anybody he thought was a threat to his throne. His sons, his brothers... His wife. This is how brutal. So when Herod is troubled, that's why Jerusalem is troubled. 
Augustus, Augustus Caesar himself said of Herod, It is better to be Herod's pig than his son, which in the language spoken was a pun, meaning that since Herod was a Jew, he could not kill and eat his pig, and it would therefore be safer than his son. Truly, it is as though the most fiendish and blood occupant, bloody occupant ever to sit on David's throne was its occupant in the very day when he came, whose throne it was, and who would in due course reign in righteousness thereon. So you have the most bloodthirsty, cruel, wicked person reigning in Herod at the time Christ, the most peaceful and loving person, is born. Matthew two eleven through 15, God will provide. In Matthew 2, verses 2 through 15, Joseph is warned in a dream to make Mary, to take Mary and Jesus to Egypt until the death of Herod. Remember, Herod is going to kill the babies. Prior to the visit of the wise men, Joseph and Mary were too poor to make a, tr a trip to Egypt and live there. However, now that the wise men brought gold, God had provided a way for their escape. God will always provide a way if we will put our trust and faith in him. Faith in him meaning do what God wants, when he wants, and how he wants. And God will provide a way. As Nephi said, I know that God giveth no commandment unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them to accomplish the thing which he hath commanded them. He commands Joseph to take his family into Egypt. He has no money. Gold is brought by the wise men. Now they have the money. Here again we see the righteous nature of Joseph being worthy to receive revelation to guide and direct his family. Along with this and other things, we're going to see why God chose these two to be the family of the Son of God, even Jesus Christ. Chose, in choosing Joseph and Mary, he chose two very spiritual people. This is one example of Joseph's spirituality. Matthew two sixteen through 18, the slain of the innocent. Eller McConkie writes, How the work of slaughter went forward, we do not know. Recognizing Herod's penchant for intrigue and secrecy, and recalling that the soldiers slew Zacharias because he would not reveal the desert hiding place of the infant John, we assume that the children were ferreted out by assassins and informers who went as Judases in disguise. Both Edersheim and Farrar, those are two gospel scholars of the 1800s, conclude that the number slain did not exceed 20, but whenever the number but whatever the number, the cries of weeping parents, relatives, and friends in fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy concerning Rachel and her children ascended up to the Lord by whom they will be replayed in Herod's ears when he is brought before the bar of the great Jehovah to give account of the deeds done in the flesh. A murderous person indeed, very self-centered and selfish Matthew 2, 16 through 18, the slain of the innocent continued, Joseph Smith tells us the following concerning why didn't John, John lived in that same area, Hebron, not too, just south of Bethlehem. Why does he not get killed? Because he is of the age. Let us come, quoting Joseph Smith, let us come into New Testament times. So many are ever praising the Lord and his apostles. We will commence with John the Baptist. When Herod's edict went forth to destroy the young children, John was about six months older than Jesus and came under this hellish edict, and Zacharias caused his mother to take him into the mountains, where he was raised on locusts and wild honey. When his father refused to disclose his hiding place and bring the officiating high priest at the temple that year, was slain by Herod's order between the porch and the altar, as Jesus said. John's head was taken to Herod, this is later in his life, the son of this infant murderer, in a charger notwithstanding there was never a greater prophet born of a woman than him. So, Christ is saved 
by Joseph being warned in a dream they flee to Egypt. John is saved by Zacharias dying, not revealing the hiding place of John in the wilderness. Both had faith in Christ, but both had very different outcomes. Now let's turn to some things in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 4, to be taxed was the excuse. That's the excuse they give people of why they are going to Bethlehem. The great scholar E. Mary Smallwood, a historian of Roman and Jewish history, relates that only Joseph would have to have gone to Bethlehem, with some sources suggesting that they could have maybe both of them taken care of the taxes in Nazareth. She points out and gives evidence that at the, at the most, only Joseph would have gone down. What man in their right thinking mind would take a nine-month pregnant woman 80 miles through hill country from Nazareth down to Bethlehem? There is only one reason he does that, and Mary submits to it and is willing to go. What, what, what woman in the right mind, being nine months pregnant, would submit to such torturous travel, being nine months pregnant? It's because they have to go there. However, Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem. The prophecy so prophesied. So Joseph and Mary heed the Spirit to go. There is one of two things. One, they have read scripture in the synagogue and they know of the scripture that he is born in Bethlehem. Or two, having maybe not read the scriptures, they are close to the Spirit and the Spirit tells them, go, go to Bethlehem. That is where he has to be born to fulfill prophecy. Either way, Joseph and Mary are two very, two very spiritual people close to the Holy Ghost and close to God and willing to submit to all things. That's why they go to Bethlehem because the Spirit tells them they must and they obey. No wonder these two were chosen to be the parents of the Son of God. Luke 2, 7, the famous line, there was no room for them in the inn. Let's consider that phrase. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said the following, There are so many lessons to be learned from the sacred account of Christ's birth that we, may, that we always hesitate to emphasize one without considering all the others. Forgive me while I do just that. One impression which has persisted with me is that this is a story of intense poverty. I wonder if Luke did not have some special meaning when he wrote, not there was no room in the inn, but specifically that there was no room for them in the inn. Isn't that interesting? There's no room for them, for Mary and Joseph. Back to Elder Holland. We cannot be certain but it is my guess that money could buy influence in those days as well as in our own. I think if Joseph and Mary had been a people of importance or wealth, they would have found lodging even at that busy time of year. So what does that tell us? If the innkeeper had known who they were truly and who the son that was going to be born, he would have let them in instantly. So what's the reason we keep him out of our hearts? It's because we don't know who he is. Just like they didn't know who he is, and they refused them. Maybe because she was pregnant, or maybe because they're from Nazareth, a city that seemed to be not well liked. In any case, there was no room for them, because the innkeeper didn't know them. I will only let the Savior into my heart, in direct proportion to how well I know him. 
I have wondered if the Joseph Smith translation also was suggesting that they did not know any influential people when it says there was no one to give them room in the inns, plural, Joseph Smith had. That was finishing Elder Holland's quote. Yeah, they must have not have known influential people, and obviously the people did not know who these two special people were, and especially who this extraordinary baby was. Luke 2, 15 through 16, what is my response to Revelation? Luke 2, 15 through 18 says, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, Remember, this is after the angels had come to the shepherds. They heard choirs from heaven sing. And the angels told them where to find the babe, the Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of David. After they had gone away, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and Mary and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Notice their reaction. Let us go, now go, let us now go. And they came with haste. When the Spirit speaks to me in direct revelation, or the prophets instruct us and give us counsel, what is our response, brothers and sisters? Let me do now. Let me go with haste to accomplish what the Spirit has directed me. Or do I put it off? Do I procrastinate? Are we as wise as the shepherds to go now and to come with haste? Jesus is presented in the temple, Luke 2, verses 22 through 24. Elder McConkie writes, Jesus is now at least 41 days old, and the Holy Family are yet living in Bethlehem. And Joseph and Mary and their son go to Jerusalem to the temple. They have two reasons. The child, Jesus, as the firstborn son, must be redeemed. And Mary, having born a son, must be purified. Such was the law, to which in all points the Holy Family conformed. When Jehovah slew the firstborn in all the homes in Egypt, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh in his palace to the firstborn of the basic serf in the lowest hovel in the land, and when he had saved alive the firstborn in every family in Israel, on whose door the saving blood had been sprinkled, he took in payment that his goodness might be remembered to all generations, the firstborn of all the Israelites. These would be his ministers. When the sacrificial rites and other holy ordinances were performed, it would be the firstborn in every family who would minister before Jehovah. Had this provision remained in force, Jesus would have been, like Zacharias, a priest in the temple. But later, in the Old Testament, the Levites, as reward for special devotion and valiance, were chosen as a tribe to serve in the place and stead of the firstborn in all the families of all the tribes. These later, latter were to be redeemed, each individually, from their obligation of a life of priestly service by the payment of five shekels of the sanctuary. This sum Joseph paid to redeem his son, and thus was accomplished the first purpose for their visit to the holy house. So what it's saying is in the Old Testament, when the Israelites are saved from the destroying angel, God required the firstborn of every person, every male, to serve God. That was the payment for saving their firstborn by the blood of the Lamb. Well, God changes that and says, I will take now in lieu of that, I will take the tribe of Levi. However, there were more firstborn than there were the tribe of Levi, so all the others were redeemed by a payment, by money. And so ever since then, all firstborn had to be redeemed 
by paying the five shekels. Christ being a firstborn, his parents then go and pay the price, the redemption money. Isn't that interesting? Here is the one who would redeem us through his blood, is paying the redemption money. He was the redemption money. All of that symbolized him, but yet he kept the law that he gave anciently in every wit. The Savior would keep every facet and every point of the law. Now Mary must undergo the rite of purification. She must become ceremonial clean. For this the law required the offering of a lamb for a burnt offering, that is, a sacrifice of service and devotion, of worship and self-surrender to the Lord, and also the offering of a turtle dove or a young pigeon as a sin offering, that is, as its name implies, a sacrifice for the remission of personal sins that had been committed through ignorance. Those too poor to pay for a lamb, and such was the case with Mary, could substitute another turtle dove or young pigeon. And so that's the other reason they go, is for her purification rites according to the law of Moses. On this occasion, Mary entered the court of the women, dropped the price of her sacrifice into one of the thirteen trumpet-shaped chests, heard the sound of the organ, announcing that incense was about to be kindled on the golden altar, made her way as one for whom a special sacrifice was being ordered to a place near the sanctuary, and there, while the ordinance was performed, meaning the sacrifice is offered, offered up the unspoken prayers of praise and thanksgiving of a grateful heart. Thus she became Levitically clean. Every one of those sacrifices pointed to the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's why they had so many of them. Jehovah was constantly trying to remind them of his great sacrifice. And now the one who had just born the babe, who would be the sacrifice, is following the law of Moses and offering an animal sacrifice to become Levitically clean. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That's Luke 2, verse 40. That's the only, we have that, and there's one other that talk about him growing in the spirit and becoming mature and growing physically that we have of his growing up years. The only thing we have is his ministering in the temple of when they go to Bethlehem for the Passover when Jesus is 12. See, by that age, he would become now a son of the law. He would now be considered an adult, and he would be required to participate in all of the rites of the law. So when he goes to the Passover, that time with his family, Joseph and Mary, he would now have participated in the sacrifices of the Passover and of the morning sacrifice that day. It seems perfectly clear that our Lord grew mentally and spiritually on the same basis that he developed physically. In each case, he obeyed the laws of experience and of learning, and the rewards follow, flowed to him. The real issue of concern is not that he grew and developed and matured, all in harmony with the established order of things, as in the case with all men, but that he was so highly endowed with talents and abilities, so spiritually sensitive, so in tune with the infinite, that his learning and wisdom soon excelled that of all his fellows. His knowledge came to him quickly and easily because he was building, as is the case with all men, upon the foundation laid in pre-existence. He brought with him from that eternal world the talents and cap capacities, the inclinations to conform and obey, and the ability to recognize truth that he had there acquired. Mozart had musical ability at the age of six that only a handful of men have ever gained in a whole lifetime. Jesus, when yet a child, had spiritual talents that no other man in a hundred lifetimes could attain. 
He grew just like all of us from grace to grace and from grace from grace. I mean, grace for grace. And so he grew and matured, but his was extraordinary because one, he always had the God's Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, to be with him. And two, he never sinned to, to impede his growth like we do from time to time and then have to make that up and then go again and then be impeded a little bit and have those obstacles. He just constantly grew and grew and always had the Holy Ghost with him. So you can see by the age of 12. Well, let's take a look and see what he did know by the age of 12. Finishing this quote from the mortal Messiah, further in his study and in the learning process, he was guided from on high in a way that none other has ever been. Being without sin, being clean and pure and spotless, he was entitled to the constant companionship of the Holy Spirit, the spirit that will not dwell in an unclean tabernacle, the spirit that conversely always and everlastingly dwells with the righteous. The Holy Ghost is a relevant revelator and a sanctifier. Anyone who receives the Holy Ghost receives revelation. Anyone who obtains the companionship of the Holy Spirit is sanctified. Of the Lord Jesus, the scripture says, God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him, which is to say that he enjoyed at all times the fullness of that light and guidance and power which comes by the power of the Holy Ghost to the faithful. See, it wasn't just little by little by, he grew little, little naturally, but the, the scriptures, God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him, the spirit was always enjoyed by him in a fullness. And so you can imagine as he grows and matures physically and mentally, then he is just going to that much more recognize and follow the Holy Ghost. Joseph Smith said the following concerning Christ. When still a boy, he, Jesus, had all the intelligence necessary to enable him to rule and govern the kingdom of the Jews. Now, do you catch that? That means as a boy, so I'm assuming by 12, he knows who he is and he has the intelligence necessary to govern as the king of the Jews. He knows who his father is. He knows his mission. He has it all. He would have to know all things of the plan and know who he is and who his father is and have had revelation from him. Remember, the Holy Ghost is a revelator and he always had the Holy Ghost with him. So Jesus was constantly receiving revelation. If he had the intelligence necessary enabling him to rule and govern, then he knew by then who he was. Continuing the quote by Joseph Smith, and could reason with the wisest and most profound doctors of law and divinity and make their theories and practices to appear like folly compared with the wisdom he possessed. But he was a boy only and lacked physical strength even if to defend his own person, and was subject to cold, to hunger, and to death. So as a boy, so probably at least by 12, he has enough emotional, mental maturity and knowledge and wisdom and revelation to rule as and govern as the king of the Jews. He knows who he is. He is just physically not ready yet to fulfill his mission. And so by 12, he must wait 21 more years. Or 19 years, 20 years before he can start his mission. 21 years before he will end it at 33. Is it any wonder then that we find Jesus in the temple where the leaders were hearing and asking him questions? That's how Joseph Smith changed it in JST Matthew 2.46. He was not asking them because what questions was he asking them? He didn't need, he had been taught by revelation and from his father on high by then. Yeah, they were asking him questions, amazed at the 
glory and majesty probably of his answers and of his being and of his person. Also, consider what must have gone through the youth Joe Jesus' mind as he participated in the ceremonies of the temple sacrifices for the first time as a son of the law, now being twelve, which sacrifices are symbolically represent which all symbolically represented him and his mission. Can you imagine? What it must have been like for him, having all this knowledge, who he is, what his mission is, what he must do, having, we know he studied the scriptures because he read from them and could find them. And so he knows the law. He gave the law. Can you imagine as he goes and participates as a son of the law now for the first time at age 12, as he goes down to Jerusalem, they would have participated in the morning sacrifice. There was a morning and evening sacrifice every day that represented Christ. And then he would have participated in the killing of the lamb for the Passover, which lamb also represented him, that enables us to be saved from the destroying angel, Christ's atonement, so that we can be passed over from spiritual death and physical death through the resurrection. Can you imagine as he's watching those priests slay the animals? Well, actually, you had to slay the animals. The offerer killed it. And then burn it upon the altar. The priest would lay the parts of the sacrifice on the altar. Can you imagine Christ going through all of those rituals? And they all represent him. He could have shouted at age 12, That's me. I am that lamb. Can you imagine what must have went through his mind as he is participating in the ordinances that 21 years later, he would become the ordinance. He would become the lamb slain for the sins of the world. And he would be offered up. I can't even imagine what must have went through his mind as he participated in those symbolic ordinances that pointed to him and his mission. Oh, and also very little. By 12, he was so wise and knowing. And yet he had to wait till he physically matured. Brothers and sisters, no wonder we sing how great thou art and that I stand all amazed at the love Jesus offers me may we continue to grow grace for grace and from grace to grace that we may too be guided by the Spirit and follow the example of the Savior may we come to know him so that we'll let him in to our hearts May we be as wise as the wise man and follow the signs of the second coming. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel.